the kids will be down in a minute and will be paying. Okay, yeah, that's better. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I'm your host, Hena Zaberi, and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. Today we're going to be doing our Save Uyghur segment again. Um, thank you for joining us on Muslim Network TV, Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV, and soon Apple TV. Um, you can always watch us 24 seven on Samsung Galaxy 19. Um, and we hope to see you become active on the Uyghur cause as you're watching uh, the special episodes that we do on uh, the Uyghur crisis. On June 17th, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act of 2020 was passed, which imposed sanctions on any foreign individual and entities that are responsible for human rights abuses uh, being done in the detention camps. So today, um, and you know, these sanctions encompass property blocking sanctions on any person or entity involved with the concentration camps and suppression and off the Uyghurs with visa blocking sanctions on these same individuals. But today we wanted to bring in um, Peter Irvin from the, the Uyghur Human Rights Project to specifically talk about the next step you know, while we consider um, the passing of this historic bill into law as a victory, we cannot rest on our laurels and not focus on, on the terrible news that keeps coming out from that region. Um, so the next step towards achieving justice, the fight as the fight is certainly not over, uh, we're now concentrating our efforts towards the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. The act will place severe penalties and restrictions on imports of forced labor products from China. So to discuss all of this and much more, I'm inviting Peter Irwin to the show. Peter is a senior program officer for advocacy and communications at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. He's a um, master's graduate of human rights from the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE where he conducted research on China's engagement at the United Nations and its relationship to the framing of the Uyghur issue internationally. He's a for former program manager and spokesperson for the World Uyghur Congress, where he worked primarily as the UN representative for Geneva-based human rights me mechanisms, as well as with national governments and civil society. Thank you so much for being with us today, Peter. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for Justice for All as well for just, I think, all the work that we, I think the Uyghur community in particular, when I speak to people, often they they point to you guys for, for doing this work and it's been very, very helpful, I think. So I, I thank you for having me on and thanks for, for continuing with this. Well, we, you know, this is, uh, today is a, a, a national action for us. We're trying to get as many people to call Congress as possible on the Uyghur Force Prevent, uh, Labor Prevention Act. But as we're getting feedback from our community, a lot of things that we're finding out, is a lot of people are not understanding the difference between the two, two acts, what they each do. And so there's a little bit of confusion as well. So we want to dissect that and have you explain that to our audience um, and hopefully urge them to make sure that you know they go out and exercise their rights as citizens to make, sh make their Congress people know how they feel about this. Um, but before we do that, uh, please introduce yourself. Um, all the, you know, I, I did a short introduction, but I'd love to know more about your work. You were in Europe for a while. You've been working on this cause for a long time. And um, so describe your background and the work that you do. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, you, you gave a good overview already. So I'm from Canada originally. I'm based in DC now with the Uyghur Human Rights Project, but previously I'd worked for the World Uyghur Congress. Uh, the Uyghur Congress uh, it was established a number of years ago by Uyghur activists themselves. This is just a, a job that I got basically straight out of my uh, my master's degree. 
Uh, and I was able to basically be on the ground working on this issue at the UN within a few weeks, even from, from getting the job. It was just a few of us at the time. Um, I think it's really important to understand, I think in 2014, when, when I started the issue, of course, was people were speaking about it a little bit. It was an issue of sort of religious repression and, you know, you had Chinese moving into the region. Uyghurs were feeling uh, uh, much more insecure. There was issues at the time, but since then it's, it's dramatically worsened. Uh, so my work is really focused on the UN mechanisms, essentially, and and understanding and reporting to the UN and trying to get them to act on, on this kind of thing. So you have the UN mechanisms themselves, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner, but also states of so pushing member states in Geneva to either make statements. I mean, firstly, just to be aware of the situation. Again, mm -hmm. in 2014, states just didn't know who Uyghurs were, I think. And I think it's become a much more household name because, unfortunately, because of the worsening situation there. Uh, so yeah, so I worked for the Uyghur Congress for about five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just recently transitioned uh, in 2020, in February, a few months ago to the Uyghur Human Rights Project, uh, where I'm a senior program officer. The Uyghur Human Rights Project, just generally speaking, it was created by the Uyghur American Association uh, back in 2003, uh, or 2004, sorry. And it was split off a few years ago in its own, its own separate entity. The Uyghur Human Rights Project essentially is a, a research-based advocacy organization. We do our in-house research, and then we have advocates like myself who actually take the research as well as research uh, that comes from elsewhere and, and do lobbying, do advocacy work you know, in multilateral institutions or the U.S. government, for example, given that we're based in D.C. Uh, I also run an Olympics campaign, for example, with uh, with a colleague of mine. There are lots of little things happening at the same time. I think what might come up in this discussion is that if you're working in the Uyghur space, you need to be speaking about a number of dish different issues at the same time. As you mentioned, you had the Uyghur uh, uh, Human Rights Policy Act that was passed. Now, you, the, sort of the attention has been shifted to uh, forced labor. Now, again, forced labor is a big issue at the moment, but it comes out of a, a broader sort of context of, of rights abuses at the moment. So perhaps we can speak about that later. That's a bit of a background of myself. So yes, let's, uh, you know, so the Uyghurs are, and for those of us who might be joining us for the first time and have never heard of um, the Uyghurs, they're an ethnically and culturally Turkic people, and they live in the areas of Central Asia that are known to the world as East Turkestan. And the, for the Muslims amongst uh, us who are listening, this is the land of Bukhara. This is the land of Bukhari Sharif. The, 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 these are religious scholars whose books we read on a regular basis. Um, so this is not something not new to uh, to you know uh, our our ethos and our faith. Um, so just to put that in context for for our our, our viewers. Um, so would you share some of the um, some of the recent history, you know, like we've we've had um, speakers, you know, guests come on who's talked about uh, the long-term history of uh, Uyghurs in, in that region. But as we move closer to the 21st century and post, especially at, as you were speaking about in the past, these, these changes that have occurred since the formation of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Um, obviously the project starting in 2003 was started because there was a need then too but has, the need has escalated over the past decade. So um, yeah, would, I'd l we'd like to hear that from you. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we can reach back as far as we want, I suppose. I mean, you can reach back until, uh, you know, 1780 or 1760 when the Qing Dynasty took over the region. But again, I think the more recent history is, is, is sort of the most important. But again, the historical context is important. Understanding the relationship between Uyghurs and the Chinese government is very important. So really the past 250 years or so, you've seen sort of on and off a rule uh, from Chinese authorities. I mean, more or less, I mean, there's debate around sort of who was in charge at certain times. There's been a bit of a back and forth. And Uyghurs did actually establish their own limited republics in the 1930s and 40s. And again, I think that speaks to the need in some ways of the Uyghur community in the region to establish their own, uh, establish their own states because there was such a distinctiveness in terms of their ethnic identity. They didn't see Chinese rule in the region. And they still don't in a lot of ways as legitimate. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of them see it as sort of a, a colonial relationship between the Chinese government in Beijing, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know it's, it's, it's in terms of <laughs> in terms of land area, it's quite quite far away from Beijing. This region, Uyghurs call it East Turkestan, and the Chinese government calls it the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, more recently, I would say though, I think that precipitated some of the more more of the advocacy that happened. Of course, you see the Uyghur Human Rights Project, the Uyghur American Association, the Uyghur. Uh, Congress, for example, they all sort of spread up in the 
either the late 90s or the early 2000s. And this is because Uyghurs were able to basically leave the country and they were able to do some of the advocacy. So my former former boss in, in Germany, Dolkanisa, the current president of the Uyghur Congress, um, he escaped China in the 90s. And then, of course, he worked with activists overseas and created the World Uyghur Congress eventually. Um, so just to give a bit of context around, you know, the past 10 or 15, maybe 20 years of what's been happening, uh, you see a little bit of restlessness in the 1980s. So Dolkanisa, as I mentioned, and other Uyghur activists who are now abroad, they try to raise some of these grievances with the Chinese government in the 1980s. I mean, it wasn't such a bad situation. You see the cultural revolution was, you know, it was bad for everybody in the country. There's a bit of an opening up period in the 80s. And then the Chinese government clamps down a bit harder. Uh, and you see the grievances being responded to, you know, student-led protests in the 80s. 1990s, you know, there's, a, there's some violence, there's a bit of unrest. Uh, it's not very peaceful necessarily, but there there isn't sort of large scale issues mm -hmm. happening. But the Chinese government again slowly and slowly uh, begins to exert more and more pressure. You know, uh, restricting cultural rights. You have the bilingual education system, which essentially, I mean, it's bilingual in name only. It moves Uyghurs to only speaking Chinese. Again, you see this in all facets of life. Economic opportunities for Uyghurs are very limited. And then, of course, throughout this whole period, you have Chinese people being incentivized economically to move to the Uyghur region and displacing a lot of the, for example, jobs that Uyghurs would otherwise get, you just see basically some tension building. And of course you build up to 2009 and now yesterday was the anniversary, the 11th anniversary of the July 5th incident, the unrest uh, or uprising, however you want to frame it. Um, this was basically a, again, it's just difficult to frame. It's been framed by the Chinese government as ethnic rioting. Um, Uyghur activists as unrest or, or uprising essentially was a culmination of some of these policies that you know people were just angry and, mm -hmm. and this was an outbreak of violence. Uh, and then essentially since 2009, this is really where you see things change. It's sort of seen as the, the watershed moment, a turning point in terms of the approach to Uyghurs in the region. Uh, but then between 2009 and 2014, I mean, there it was things were reasonably okay in the region. There was not much happening. But 2013, you see Xi Jinping be appointed. You see the party, party secretary in the region appointed in 2016, who had a stint in Tibet before. Between 2013 and 2016, you really see things change. Uh, it, it's, it's in terms of, again, religious freedom, language rights, cultural rights, uh, freedom of movement. I mean, you can basically take any issue you want to talk about. We can talk about it. And you see the Chinese government basically pressing Uyghurs harder and harder until you see what you see today is essentially the, uh, the mass detention of Uyghurs in camps to, uh, meant to forcibly assimilate them. And this is something that you said that I wanted to point out, that things may not have been bad in perhaps city centers, but rural areas were still being, you know, um, the, the persecution and the, uh, especially the reports, I, uh, I remember even then, you know, 2000, after 2009, uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, the religious rights were still like people were still not allowed to fast and that that was still happening but as but so that that shift that you're talking about around uh, 2014 um, can you pinpoint that shift what was that exact um, did the elite start getting affected the educated people started get if, getting affected communist party members as well got, what was that you know linchpin yeah, I think what you could point to is essentially Xi Jinping himself. It was him as a figure, as and then he, it basically all stems from him. He wanted to have a much tougher policy on, you know, so-called ethnic minorities, which included Tibet, included Uyghurs, included other people. But I would say if you want to point to one, you know, one moment or one person himself, it would be Xi Jinping himself. Because you see a lot of the policies. Uh, New York Times had some leaks last year that were pretty revealing. Uh, showed some internal speeches that Xi Jinping had made to, you know, just internal Communist Party uh, uh, members, essentially saying that we need to basically uh, crush the Uyghur people with no mercy to make sure that they there's just no freedom at all. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, I suppose if your audience would want to know when was the turning point, it was uh, the, the appointment of Xi Jinping. Again, but building on policies that existed before. Yes. I think I have to catch myself sometimes because when I say things were okay, this is all just relative. I'm comparing it to today where things have just dramatically worsened. I wouldn't say in 2010 or 2011, Uyghurs on the ground would not tell you that things were okay. They were absolutely not. As you mentioned, religious freedom was restricted already, language rights, things like this. So it existed before, but it's just intensified. Mm -hmm. So um, now we're, you know, uh, as, as you're, you started doing your research, what were the things that really, uh, 
pushed you to, and especially the when, when you've been reporting it to the United Nations, what were the sort of things that you were reporting on? Well, I suppose it depends on what time period you're, you're speaking about, but I think when I began in 2014, it was religious repression. It was issues with religious freedom, religious expression. Every Ramadan, for example, yeah, she a good marker of this was to basically check every Ramadan and see what the reports are like. Mm. So how much was uh, fasting being restricted? And that's that's sort of one small gauge that you can see. Okay, fasting was restricted a little bit in some areas, and every year subsequently, since about 2011, actually, you see the change. So we're reporting on religious freedom, uh, language rights were a big thing too. It's just again this very slow process of just. Uh, undermining the use of the language to the point where Uyghurs were just not able to use it anymore. Or there will be uh, region-wide policies or prefecture-wide policies essentially to say you cannot speak the Uyghur language in school. So it was mostly these things that were bringing up with states, uh, bringing up with uh, UN officials themselves, the Office of the High Commissioner. But I think the reason it didn't really take off, and there's a number of reasons for that, but it just it sort of fell into the same category as you know religious repression generally in different <clears throat> states around the world. Uh, but we, I think we saw things happening that maybe other people, of course, didn't see, and it was hard to get across the states. You know, we were we were yelling about religious freedom for Uyghurs for a number of years until, you know, things just got worse to the point where people were surprised by it. So I think one thing to take away from this is that, look, Uyghurs themselves and people working in this space knew that this was happening. Exactly. No one was listening, right? So there's the warning signs were absolutely there. There was no response from the international community. And then, of course, we all wonder, well, why why did it get so bad? Because the Chinese government knew that this, you know, there was no response, and they kept testing the waters. They kept testing out the policies, and they got, you know, they get to the point where there's concentration camps, essentially, and there still hasn't been a response, a really good response. And then, of course, we celebrate the passage of a of the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, which, of course, is is fantastic, and it has it's the product of years of work by Uyghur activists. But in some ways, you know, it's just in some ways it's symbolic there so we can get into details about the act itself or the prevention the Uyghur for safe prevention act but you know it's just the fact that we celebrate this and as you mentioned at the beginning it's certainly not the end of the road this is the beginning this is a template for how we take this to other governments but uh yeah i think there's a lot of work to do still i suppose so what can, let's talk about that a little bit that this uh, the Uyghur human rights um prevention act how can other governments in canada in the in europe or um, around the world, Muslim countries, what can they learn from this and what can they implement, um, especially in the European context, since you, you that, that's where you recently came from? Sure. I mean, we, we can talk about both acts, I suppose. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, I want to start with the, the Human Rights Act because sure. that was the basis, and then we'll move to talking about the Forced Labor Act. Yeah, right. So the, I think, again, I will reiterate that the passage and the signing of the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, of course, is historic. And I think it's something that, again, Uyghurs and the Uyghur community and activists, uh, you know, like the executive director of our organization, have been pushing for a long time. And it's very encouraging that this happened and there's a lot more support for it. And as I mentioned, yes, there are symbolic aspects of it. I think it signals that there's legislation from a state who actually wants to push back against this. Um, if you want to go into actual details of the act itself, um, it is uh, requested that the president impose sanctions, targeted sanctions against individual officials. There's a required report by the Secretary of State and the appointment of, a, of an individual to actually be tasked with this issue in, in particular. Um, there's an FBI report. This is also another aspect of it that's very important too, is that while the FBI report, of course, will not address what's happening in the region, it'll address intimidation, for example, against Uyghurs overseas, which is becoming a, a, a much worse problem. Um, so there's there's some key elements to the act that are very important. I, I don't want to um, sort of brush aside that, I think. But as you mentioned, I think what will be very important is that the international community, especially European states, uh, take this as a template. Of course, the U.S. has its own approach, but the European Union, and we can speak about this too, is that have, they have been very weak on this issue. They just have not been speaking out. I think the approach from, in Canada, I'm from Canada myself, but Canada has, has th their own issues at the moment, but I think they have been sort of, more supportive of a quiet diplomacy approach to the EU takes this approach to say, look, we're not going to say things in public because it might undermine our uh, private advocacy. And you know, that's not our position on this. But I think European member states, for example, EU member states can take this as a template to, to basically uh, to use it for sanctions in particular. I think sanctions, mm -hmm. insofar as they are still symbolic, they actually will have consequences for individual officials, which you just haven't seen at all yet. Mm -hmm. And so 
coming back. And so this is something that uh, people need to understand. And I think because of some of the reports that are recently coming out, even though forced labor camps are not something new in that region, um, what are some of the things that uh, some of the reports that have come out, especially the Associated Press report that came out and um, recently um, uh, the report that came out from the um, port in New Jersey, um, if you could share something about that and how that relates to uh, forced labor. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, again, it's good that we, we discussed sort of how, what the backdrop of this issue is, because I think when we see these reports, at least from my perspective, this actually, I mean, a lot of these things that come up are not very surprising. You, you see things that most people are more surprised by, but this for me was surprising. The AP report was surprising in that, I mean, there's actually uh, evidence from the Chinese government that they could potentially be committing genocide. Mm. And we can have a conversation about that word and what it means and like, what perspective you might want to take on using it um, and what kind of determinations might be, legal determinations might be made. But I think the AP report, which essentially what it was is that, uh, so there are two things that happened. Adrian Zenz, a China scholar, had his own report uh, with the James Sound Foundation. The Associated Press was reporting on this as well basically forced sterilizations, a dramatic increase in forced sterilizations, firstly, in the Uyghur region between 2015 and 2018. You also saw a dramatic uh, decline in birth rates. So you see birth rates in the Uyghur region between 2015 and 2018, you know, dramatically decline. Um, and then also there's the, uh, the uh, pretty dramatic increase in the use of IUDs, so for, for, forcing women essentially to, to use IUDs. Uh, we had sort of anecdotal reports about this before as well, about women in the camps being injected and then they would not have their period, their menstrual cycles would be uh, would be altered. Now, we took that with a bit with a, a grain of salt because we just did not get sort of more widespread cases of this, but we knew that perhaps it was maybe indicative of a larger trend. We don't have evidence until now. The AB report really provides this evidence and so does Adrian Zenz in this report. So I think that's the first thing that actually us in the Uyghur community uh, as well, we're surprised by this because, you know, it actually points to something that could be labeled genocide. The other report that you mentioned was one that, in which I think uh, tons and tons of, something like 80 tons of, of human hair uh, that had re basically reached the border and the, 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 the border agents in the U.S., uh, as far as I know, they, they, they rejected it and they said, you know, we can't bring this in because there's a credible belief that this could be, you know, produced in camps. You know, I think the human hair is touches a nerve because again, we, we look back at the Holocaust, for example, and examples like this, uh, again, it's very unclear the exact origin and what the nature is, where did it come from exactly, but there's reasonable, uh, we have reason to believe that it came from the camps themselves, you know. And so that is something that, uh, you know, I was reading the reports on that from the, there's a 78% increase in exports in hair from that region. Uh, yeah. since 2017. So the core, you know, where is suddenly all of this hair coming from, if not from the, um, and um, Gulchehra's um, Hoja, uh, a Uyghur journalist has reported, you know, her investigation and uh, some of the people who have been released for the camps have also testified that uh, their hair was. And so, I, and I believe for as Muslim women, this touches us because this is something, you know, j just the fact that uh, you're not allowed to cover your hair as 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 prescribed by your faith because of the same government who now chooses to steal it and sell it. And then just to have, you know, so that is just something that is just so like, um, it's mind blowing, these sort of like, uh, you know, evil <laughs> honestly that's all i can say about mm -hmm. that 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 thought process is to you know the, you just dehumanizing uh, people into making them into just and that and the organ harvesting all of this like there's just so much that uh, i think that is sometimes why it's hard for people to absorb and they switch off their attention because it just seems so horrific that in 2020 this is happening um but and then uh, not and some of the stuff that was uh, captured was synthetic. It wasn't actual human hair. So what was the uh, why was that captured? Why was that projected? 
Well, I think there's been some more action from U.S. border agents. Again, I, I'm not sure if I can speak to specifics about that. But again, last week there was also the, an advisory that was issued by the State Department, Commerce, and Treasury, essentially putting state companies on notice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this also relates, as you mentioned before, to the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act. I think it's not a, it's not legislation that's been passed yet, but it's important in that it, it speaks to a lot of the similar issues like this, because what the Forced Labor Prevention Act actually does introduced just earlier this year um, to address forced labor, essentially coming out of uh, some of the other reports, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute had a report on this, uh, that a lot of this is based on, and it does four things. The first, which is key in the seizure of the hair, for example, was it creates a rebuttable, uh, some presumption uh, on forced labor in the Uyghur region. So essentially what it does is that any company who wishes to import goods into the US, they have to be the ones, the onus is on the companies who are importing these goods they must prove essentially that it, it is they that they demonstrate a, a clean supply chain that this is not connected at all to uh, forced labor. You know that flips things, right? So typically, it's not the onus is not on the company to say to prove that it you know because it's, it's a high it's a high bar to set um, to basically make the company uh, prove that uh, the, the, these products are not being imported and not part of a supply chain tainted with forced labor, right? So that's, that's and, that's, and that's a superb thing to do because it's why should the onus be on customers, especially when the market is, uh, you know, saturated with made in China products. So how can a customer, uh, you know, it, it would be different where if it was a country where there's just, you know, certain speciality uh, items or, uh, and then it would be easy to boycott, but how are you going to boycott something that, you know, a, a, a country that supplies virtually everything that, and that's something that when we've been talking about boycotts that happens, people are like, oh, it's so hard to boycott China any, because everything's made in China, right? Um, so that's some, that narrative that comes up. So this um, uh, act says, um, you know, description of the bill reads to ensure that goods made with forced labor in Xinjiang, Uyghur autonomous region, of the People's Republic of China do not enter the United States market and for other purposes. So um, if this bill is supported by Congress, and we're hoping that it will, and by Senate and passes, what would the significance of this bill be? Like, what effect do you think um, it would be for, uh, you know, uh, for Uyghur activists and people working towards this cause? What um, what would you know? So I'd, I'd like to get your take on that. Yeah, sure. As you mentioned, I think yeah, the main thing is that because it shifts the onus to companies and the importers, I think that's that's big in itself. I think it's been too long that companies have been working in this region. For example, Volkswagen has a plant in the Uyghur region, and you know, and you had Herbert D as the CEO about a year ago saying, "Look, I don't know anything about these camps." I think what it does is it shifts that the companies are forced to actually pay attention to what's happening. They would wish to not pay attention before. Now they actually have to pay attention to what's happening and how it affects their supply chains. They actually have to do proactive things uh, that ensures that their supply chains are free from forced labor. That seems like a pretty easy thing, right? I mean, to, you know, just don't have forced labor in your supply chains. You can go to every single one of these companies that's mentioned in the ASPE, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute report, Uyghurs for Sale is the report title. I mean, every single one of these companies will say in their own documents, look, we do not support forced labor, where we are, you know, following ILO, uh, ILO conventions, we, we, you know, no company wants to be implicated in this. Mm -hmm. So again, I think the main thing is that it forces companies to actually pay attention. China is a huge market for every, you know, every company in the world, really, who, who does business overseas. China is a massive market. So I think, it sh again, it shifts that, that burden to them to make sure they're making sure their supply chains are clean. I think, again, I don't want to understate the importance of symbolism. And, you know, of course, removing your, you know, cleaning your supply chains from forced labor is one thing. Will it affect what's happening on the ground for Uyghurs? Okay, it might a bit longer in the future, for example, but, but it decreases a new kind of relationship between companies and the Chinese government. Chinese government starts to think, hmm, maybe we shouldn't be using forced labor because companies, you know, will be barred from using our products or for importing our products or having a supply chain that's even related to forced labor. Right, so again, it might be a bit distant, but it, it starts the process of ensuring that, that China knows that it, it might have to alter its behavior because it's losing money. Right? But I think one of the themes that comes up 
for our work, or at least for myself and my advocacy with the Uyghur Human Rights Project, you, we need to be uh, levying a cost on China for, for what they're doing. The yeah. problem is the reason that they have not changed their behavior is because the cost has not, the cost has not been great enough for the Chinese government to change their behavior. There, you know, and I think you see this in the responses uh, to some of the statements or some of the, the legislation that's passed. I think until you change uh, that cost or you fix, uh, fix a cost on China, there will be no change. And I think this actually does that. I think this this act actually does uh, take steps towards that. And again, we can speak about you know the within the act itself. There's other aspects of it that might be helpful as well. But that's that's overarching. That's the overarching main thing that I think is would be beneficial from this act itself. And also, we, again, it could serve as a template for other governments to pass similar legislation as well. You know, is there anything that's been left out, or do you think it could have been improved? To be honest, I think it's a, I think it's a solid bill. I think if this is passed, it would be very, very effective. To be honest, but, but I think uh, one thing too, and to speak about the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, the other bill, the first bill that's already been passed, is that implementation is key, right? So you have a number of things within the bill, but if they're not implemented, you know, they're a bit useless. So you, I think again, that and that really speaks to the importance of what you said again. I'll repeat it: that okay, the bill passed, but you need to actually push, keep pushing from NGO, from our perspective, from civil society, pushing the representatives to actually implement aspects of the bill because they can celebrate. Okay, look, we passed this thing, you know, and then people might lose a bit of attention. But implementation is key, and I think that's. I think is if the bill passes as it stands, I think it will be very effective. So how, um, you know, and this is something that. Uh, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about is, uh, you know, while we're pushing uh, the, you know, these bills and while we're working on the ground, uh, Uyghur organizations, uh, allies, people who are wor worried about fair labor, the Fair Labor Association, other other allies in, um, in uh, the labor unions, uh, people tend, uh, a lot of times when you hear what you hear back, especially from Muslim majority countries is that this is a conspiracy. This is, a, a, you know, ch um, American, um, you know, an effort to change the regime in China, um, and it's all about like a new Cold War. What would you like to say as a Canadian working for in Europe for uh, the World Uyghur Congress? Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a common argument I hear. I hear from a number of different people. I hear in the press. And I think it's important to know that there's something to that. I think I think there are indications that, you know, there are certain actors who maybe don't care about human rights. They, they, they This does enter into certain, this quasi neo-Cold War relationship between states. I think what I typically say is, look, okay, there may be some of that, but for, at least for CSOs, for governments who actually do care about this, for political leaders in the U.S. from both parties, um, a lot of them really just actually do care about human rights. Um, and I think that underscores the importance of uh, maybe getting out of this sort of America versus China relationship and understanding it as, look, we're just pushing for principle, a principled stance on human rights. Um, the U.S. human rights record is not perfect as well. No country has a perfect human rights record. Some are better than others. Um, but I think the main thing is that what will combat this, this argument, which is the argument that the Chinese government makes too, right? They make this... Well, no, it's just a politicized issue. I was in the UN for five years, and they said the same thing over and over. Every time you brought up human rights, they said it's all politicized. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's, of course, not true for the most part, but we need to make sure that we're coming at this issue as a coalition. Mm -hmm. So the importance of having Turkey, for example, standing up for Uyghurs, they've had, there's some indications that the government has been a little bit supportive. You know, Malaysia and Indonesia would be really great to have them making more critical comments. I think it's important that, Although the U.S. has been the loudest, uh, we need to have countries in Western Europe, for example, or Southern Europe or places like this join this coalition, but also reaching out more forcefully to um, OIC member states, for example. The OIC, as we both know, has been just horrendous, not only silent, but supportive of what's happening. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that, that, that underscores the importance of ensuring that it's not just the usual suspects in this is not just the, the U.S. It's not just Canada or the West, you know, Western European countries. That is a broad coalition which would undermine this argument that it's a political issue. Because I think Uyghurs and people in this space know that it's not, that it shouldn't be. And to be the most effective advocates, you need to make sure that it is about human rights because that's the issue that we've always been talking about. Exactly. 
Um, so this is, you know, as we wrap this up, um, you know, what are, uh, in your advocacy especially, what are you concentrating on um, now? And uh, what would you like our audience to do um, for this cause? Sure, so with the Uyghur Human Rights Project, we're continuing our research work. Uh, we have a number of research projects on the go. There's too much work for the staff that we have at the moment, but I think we've we've been reasonably effective in the past few years, and we're gonna continue doing that as a staff and getting better at it and working with Uyghur activists and different actors. Um, it's encouraging that in some ways there's more interest in the space, but it opens up doors, I think, for our, our advocacy work. Um, that being said, in terms of what individuals can do, or what other groups of people can do. Um, I think the first thing I think is just learning about the issue. I think as we identified early on is that the Uyghur issue is just not one that previously was really known to people at all. I think there's some more awareness and that's a product of unfortunately because the situation got so bad and you get these horrendous reports coming up. People have been speaking to me about this who had otherwise not known about the issue. So firstly, just understanding, learning a bit about the issue. You know, there's books available. So Gardner Bobbin has a book uh, strangers in their own land, or even read it about history. So James Millward has Eurasian Crossroads, it's a bit deeper history, historical text, or just, you know, read press reports that are coming out. Um, go on the UHRP website, of course, I would say this, but I think we, we have a compilation of uh, information or news stories that come up, you know, follow us on social media. Again, I say this just because we collate stories that come up all the time, what's the most relevant things that people should be noticing. Um, and as we mentioned, as you mentioned too, today was the day where people, you wanted people to go and actually call their political officials. I'm an American, so I'm not, I don't know, I'm not a constituent necessarily, but I think that's important too, is that, you know, tell your representatives uh, to think about this issue, vote for representatives who actually make it clear that they're focusing on this issue, that they at least understand what's happening and they would vote in support of the Forced Labor Prevention Act, for example, the Rear Forced Labor Prevention Act. Um, of course, you have an election coming up in November. That's something to keep in mind. Understand what the candidates say about this issue and what the response will be. Um, and then there's things like, you know, I know signing a petition is a little, sometimes you get the charge that it will, because it's a little bit lazy. You just sign your name. But it actually does in some ways, um, it, it does show that there's symbolic support from the, from the international community for issues. So Abaz, for example, had a petition that's close to a million signatures. You Uyghur Human Rights Project ourselves. Uh, we have an Olympic petition, so as we, not to bring this up at the end, but China is hosting Olympics in 2022 in Beijing, right? And this is an issue that's, that's continuing, that, that will continue to come up. Essentially, the message of the campaign is that China cannot be hosting an Olympics while they have concentration camps. And now the campaign will probably expand to they cannot have the Olympics if they are committing genocide. I mean, without a qualifier, proper genocide against the people. So, you know, you can sign the petition. It's called No Rights, No Games, the campaign, which I'm sure will increase in, in its activity uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, again, yeah, I think the main thing is just educate yourselves. And I think our website, for example, UHRP has a what you can do section with a more comprehensive list of things that you can do as an individual. But I think if you stay informed, I think that's the first step. And I think you'll probably take steps after that if you understand what's happening. I think it's hard for the international community to stay silent if people know what's happening. And see, this is what we, what I always say to people, this is a fact, like you can be as far, and you don't have to be Muslim, you don't have to be Uyghur, you don't have to, you, do, you just have to care about human beings and care about the fact that you don't want another Holocaust in, in your, you know, right, you know, we all often think what would we have reacted if we were alive during that time, right, or what if we were active during that time. Well, you are active and alive today, and yeah. this is happening today to a group of people for it's it, for no it, it wasn't and for no cause. That's what's like. It, this isn't a war. This isn't it. You know this. It, this is for uh, it's an occupied people who are now being wiped out. So that is one thing that I always say. The other thing is that uh, it affects us. Like when we put on those Nike shoes and we buy those Carter baby clothes and we, uh, you know, buy this Apple computer that we're having this show on, we're complicit and our money is going to buy this stuff. And how does that sit with us? Like, how does, like, how, are we okay with using enslaved labor? I mean, as, as some of these, you know, you, we've heard the stories from the camps of people who've been in the camps of what they, what life is like the, uh, in forced labor camps, um, you know? So 
to, to is that okay with us? Is that okay mm -hmm. to wear those shoes? So as part of this is just that human connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, and since China is such a gigantic supplier, you know, we always talk about the 80% of cotton in China comes from the, the this region, and 30% of all American cotton is from China. So where does you know what the you know what is the chances that the T-shirt that we're wearing was made by an enslaved person in one of these concentration camps. So this is something that we, you know, consistently, and um, I mean, thank you for your work and U UHRP's work, because without this solid research, um, a lot of times then it is just a new story or if people, it's easy to, you know, call it propaganda and it's easy to do that. So, um, and, you know, as maybe I, I'm, if you could, talk a little bit because we've talked about this before what kind of research like what does that research take it's not just oh you know i googled something up on on the internet and i posted it up uh, uh you guys are working on several research product pro projects or have in the recent uh, past too so tell, tell us what goes behind each one of those reports yeah i'm glad you raised that because it's true it's not i mean it's not library-based research we're not going into books we're not, you know this is actually uh very active group of people. You have people within the organization who, of course, are Riga themselves. There's people who speak the language, people with PhDs who have worked on this for a number of years. The experience in the Uyghur Human Rights Project is, uh, you know, it's, it's very deep and we all have particular skills that, that lead to the research that we do. So the research comes, of course, we, we speak as a group. So what are the research priorities? If I can take you sort of through the process. So what what is sort of, what is lacking? Where are the gaps in knowledge at the moment? So for example, uh, the past few research projects, we, we had one on Kashgar. Kashgar is an ancient city in the south of the Uyghur region. And we use that as sort of a, as a case study because people of course connect a few if you talk about one certain place or an individual. So we use Kashgar as a prison to understand, generally speaking, how the assimilationist policy in the Uyghur region uh, uh, happened over the past you know few decades or so. We had reports on passport seizures or basically the cancellation of passports uh, for Uyghurs abroad. Again, it's, it's about passports themselves and about basically freedom of movement restrictions, but also how does that relate to the camps? So people who have been overseas, they've been detained in camps uh, who have been overseas or they have family abroad. Um, again, you're right. So we pick subjects that are, I think, again, there's gaps in knowledge. There's things that we hear in our networks. That's one thing too, is that of course, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, I think the importance of having a, a knowledgeable Uyghur staff is that they have these networks of people who understand, who, who speak to people all around the world and can gather information. We do primary research with Uyghurs themselves uh, and other people sort of who have been um, impacted by, by some of these issues. So again, it's not just sort of, you know, going online and checking sources and looking at journal articles. It's we actually, we go into the field and we speak to Uyghurs themselves. We collate information from Uyghur sources. Um, and I think the, when you touched on this a little bit, the importance of that is that I think the reaction has been there because of the fantastic work done by journalists, done by organizations who have reported on this, Human Rights Watch, for example, and others who have some more resources to do the work. Uh, but I think without that, without, without basically funding in some ways, without having staff to do this work, it's, it's nearly impossible. We Human Rights Project, I think, in contrast to a Human Rights Watch or an Amnesty International, I think is able to, to do research that is a little deeper. We, we have contacts in different places and we're able to, to sort of pull up information from a weaker perspective, understanding sort of the cultural historic specificity of, of, of the issue at the moment, what's needed, what, what hasn't been touched on. Human Rights Watch might do a report on the camps more generally, but we can speak about to, to issues that are coming up uh, maybe a little bit more quickly. But yeah, so the research process is uh, it's fundamental to our work, and we, you know we've honed it over. The, I, I just started at UHRP in February, but the organization has honed it over you know more than a decade of our work, and I think it's been they've, they've been quite successful. The reports themselves, I think, really it's information that you just cannot find elsewhere. So I think it's really really essential, and that comes I think in some ways it comes from having some funding for staff to do it i think and that's i think yeah. something that we're we're lacking in some ways so if i could add that to the things that people could do is that donating to organizations like uhrp is really essential for us because we're chasing 10 or 15 different subjects at the same time we're working on multiple projects advocacy avenues working with governments multilaterals with cso's with academics with people the general public um we're very busy so yes yeah, if, if people had some money to join and the importance of this research is 
current, but it's also for the future too. If yeah. China is not stopped, then this rich, vast history, this language, this culture, the the food, so much is lost. Who 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 gets to who is going to preserve it? Absolutely. And so the work that you all are doing is beneficial now, but it's God forbid, like I, you know, I, you know, at, at one, I remember when, you know, I was younger, my grandmother would ever talk about, oh, you know, sometimes visiting, oh, we, we wish we could go visit Kashgar, right? Like that, that, and some of our elders may have visited it, you know, Pakistan is very close to, to uh, you know, borders uh, that region. Um, but now that is like a virtual impossibility, right? So this is this is something that is being, you know, uh, lost. Uh, and just for the, you know, so for the Muslim world, this is this is a loss of a center of learning, a center of history. Um, and so, and then for the Uyghur uh, themselves, you know, who is going to, you know, it just this or this. Um, uh, this, we'll tell the stories. Yeah, exactly. tell the stories and the, the, to, and this beautiful culture, which is very different from Chinese culture, that people don't understand. Mm -hmm. like, that's another thing that people just think it's all like, and the, the vastness of the place is so, you know, if just looking at it at the ma uh, on a map. So um, this is just really, really powerful work that is being done, and um, and, and more people should go and read the reports and actually take a look at them because so much work is put into each and every one of them. Um, That's right, yeah. yeah. And there's lots coming, of course. We're working on a number of projects at the moment. And again, it speaks to some of the issues that you just raised in terms of really documenting as sort of a, not a time capsule, but, but telling the stories of Uyghurs, that, that the information that might just be lost by Uyghurs who are, have not been able to escape the region. So religious teachings, cultural traditions, the language itself, specificity about the language, you see Uyghur language teachers outside of China uh, doing this themselves and they, they need support too, I think. Basically maintaining the language is of course essential to, to what they're doing. So I think, yeah, that, that's tremendously important, I think. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for being here today. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continuously, um, su you know, support you guys, support your work, um, get the word out to people um, and have, and as we are wrapping up, um, this is something that we're going to ask you today was our national call-in day for the Uyghur, Herman right, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Uh, currently it's in the house as 6210, HR6210. It's also in Senate as Senate Bill 3471. And um, so we keep on, you know, today was just a commemorative day because of July 5th being um, an, uh, a marking of the uprisings in Urumqi. Um, but we, it is not confined to one day. Every day, you know, pick up the phone. That's, um, you know, it takes you a minute, but if this it can ha help this bill get passed, this is how you can, you know, do something for, for those who cannot, you know, who are, who have been um, put into these detention camps and are not able to come out. So uh, we really, really um, urge you all to uh, make those calls and you know just just let them know you don't want to be a part of this cruelty. You don't want uh, these uh, products in your country. Um, so thank you so much, Peter, for joining us today. And for all of you, thank you for watching. Make those calls make each and every one of you, you need to call your Congress people, call your senators and help ask them to pass these bills. Thank you so much. And for joining us, you can continue to watch us on Muslim Network TV. This is the Justice for All Now show. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>